Zechariah chapter number 12 and verse number 1. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord. God says, I've got a burden, i got a word. Notice who he's directing the word to, Israel. Which stretches forth the heavens, talking about this Lord that's speaking to them, and layeth the foundation of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. This Lord that's speaking to Israel, this is what he wants to say. I'll make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about. They shall be in a siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. In that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces. Though all the people of the earth be gathered together, against it in that day saith the Lord I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness and I will open my eyes unto the house of Judah and I'll smite every horse of the people with blindness and the governors of Judah shall say in their heart the inhabitants of Israel shall be my strength in the Lord of the host of their God in that day I will make the governors of Judah like an hearth a, a fire among the wood and like a torch of fire in the sheath. They shall devour all the people round about them. God said, when it's all said and done, Israel, here's what you're going to do. You're going to devour every country that comes against you, whether it be on the right hand and, or on the left. Right. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. Now, I know this may seem foreign to several of you, but let me explain where we're at and what's going on here in chapter number 12 of the book of Zechariah. The word Zechariah means God has remembered. When you read the chapters of the book of Zechariah, you will find out that there are three basic interpretations that have to be viewed while going through the pages of this book. First, you, may, you must look at it historically. God reminding them of days gone by. Second of all, you must look at it doctrinally, how God establishes who he is and what he does. Then the way I'm going to look at it today, we're going to look at it prophetically. What God says about the world, the nations, and Israel in the future. I preached several weeks ago at a visiting church on the subject, the rise and the ruin of Russia. And when I preached on that, I best... 50 or 60 people came to me after service and said, Brother Kid, where is America in Bible prophecy? In the days to come, where does our country fit in? I had the privilege of being taught by three of the greatest prophetic teachers that we ever had in my generation. All of them were older than me and they're with Jesus now. I would like to give reverence and credit to Dr. Harold B. Seitler, from Greenville, South Carolina, Dr. Billy Canoy from Greensboro, North Carolina, and Dr. Bob Sensat from Jennings, Louisiana. These men walked me through verse by verse, time and time again, through the book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel, and the book of Revelation, which are three of the greatest prophetic books that dovetail together to paint a picture of what lies ahead in the future. You understand when you read the book of Zechariah that he was the son-in-law of a king at this time. He was also a priest and a prophet and a judge when Israel came back from the Babylonian captivity. He was killed in the priest's courtyard in the temple on the Sabbath day, which was also known as the Day of Atonement. This book contains 14 chapters. It's one of the 12 books that we call the Minor Prophets. There are 12 minor prophets in the Bible, all of them in the Old Testament. There are four major prophets in the Bible. All of them are in the Old Testament as well. The difference between a minor prophet and a major prophet is not that their message is minor and others are major. It's simply given that name because of the length of the content of the book. The books that are longer in content like Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Isaiah... Those are what we call the four major prophets 
because their books are much larger. So when you see somebody quote from a minor prophet, that doesn't mean the message is minor. It simply means that the length of the book is smaller. Always remember that. As Israel was permitted to go back to their homeland under the leadership of Dyrus, uh, which was over Babylon at that time, Zechariah emerges and dates his book somewhere between 520 and 518 B.C. Our text reveals in the six verses that I read to you that there is a day coming when Jerusalem will be surrounded by people and by armies. As a matter of fact, God said that the armies of the world will surround them on their left and it will surround them on their right. So devastating will be the number of these armies that surround Jerusalem and, Ju and Judah at that time that it will cause Israel, the Bible said, to be a cup of trembling. It will cause her to be dizzy and weak because she will be so overwhelmed by the sea of humanity that has come down against the unwalled city to once and for all drive her into the Mediterranean Sea. You understand that Israel is not surrounded by one ally. Whether you go north, east, or south of Israel, of course to the west is the Mediterranean Sea. All of their surrounding countries are adversaries of Israel. None of them are in alliance with Israel. They fight every day for their freedom. But this that I read to you is going to be an unusual day. Because people will come from the north, the south, the east, and the west that have never come before. These are countries that are going to come from long distances. And they all have one thing in common, to annihilate the nation of Israel. Why is there such a great hatred for Israel anyway? Why is Israel so important? It's because as a nation, they are God's chosen people. You remember when Jesus came to this earth, he came as a Jew. He came through the loins and the genealogy of Abraham. As a matter of fact, he's called the son of David. You remember the blind man yelled out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus was a Jew, God's chosen people. So it's the devil's appetite and desire to dissolve the people of God, his chosen earthly people, which is the Jewish race. But time and time again in history, God has proven his people is established forever. The, yeah. Think about it. Out of all the kingdoms and the nations of the world, only one nation in the whole world ever in the history of humanity has got up out of the cemetery of the dead, raised their flag back up the pole, and declared themselves to be an independent nation again. That happened in 1948, and it was Israel. And God prophetically said that when the tree, the fig tree began to bloom again, the raising of Israel, this would be the day when the prophetic prophecies would be starting to be fulfilled. Many of them are happening before our very eyes today. But I want to answer the question, where is our country in prophecy? If you'll study the Bible, you'll find that there are four great kings that are going to bring all the armies of the world against Israel. We know through the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 38, that the king that comes down from the north is no other than Russia, which will be combined with China. The river Euphrates will dry up and they will come across that land on dry land to come down against Jerusalem. We know through Bible study that the king of the south is Egypt. These are Arab, uh, Islamic forces, all down to the south of Egypt and all down through Africa. These are Muslim countries that hate God and they hate the Jew. They would love to come up and, and make Israel a dissolved nation. But for some reason they're scared. But when the armies of the north call them and the armies of the south get together, all of a sudden you've also got the army from the east. That's where China combines with Russia and they come down with the largest military force that the universe has ever known. The only king that's in debate in the scriptures that is not clear is the king that comes from the West. According to many theologians and Bible scholars, this is where America comes from. They believe that America will be that united kingdom from the West that joins with China and Russia and Egypt 
and bands together with one common cause to wipe out Israel and to take their spoil. You must remember two things keep Russia and China in trouble at all times. That's enough fuel and economy for their people and enough food on their table. That's why Putin is after Ukraine. One-fourth of all the wheat in the world comes from that country. And though Russia may seem strong, their common everyday people are falling apart. And their economy is collapsing. And they're literally fighting over loaves of bread in Russia while I'm preaching today. Israel, after they took their land back, the Arab countries had made the deserts nothing but huge junkyards and septic tanks. But Israel has the favor of God. They went in when they became a city and they wiped all that junk out. They irrigated all of those deserts. And now it's one of the biggest producing countries in the world because God's blessing is upon them. And only God can make a desert into a land of produce. So is America that country that comes from the West. The king that comes from the West, we do know this. He will enforce full control and demand over the people. That includes their ability to buy, sell, and trade. It's at this point the mark of the beast, which consists of three sixes, will either be put on their forehead or the palm of their hand. Without that, no matter how much money, gold, silver, or revenue you have, you will not even be able to buy a bottle of water. If you think you'll go and get some out of the water fountain or the ocean, the book of Revelation tells us that the waters will be turned to blood. Your dependency will be upon bottled water that are supplied by the government that's in control. This king, along with the other three, have one target in mind. If they can take over Israel, they feel like it'll solve all their problems. Now let me give you something to think about. All the lands of Israel to the north and over to the east and down in the south, all of those lands are oil drilling lands. Much of our oil used to come from Iran. And we dumped some of that and went to Russia. I think we jumped out of the pot and got in the fire. I wouldn't flip a nickel for the difference of either one of them God-hating countries. But what's going to happen through the first three and a half years of the tribulation period is Israel is going to discover the biggest vein of oil that the world has ever known. They're completely surrounded by oil fields by other countries. And when Israel strikes that oil, and they've got all that produce growing out of the valleys, it's going to bring those hungry countries, China and Russia, it's going to bring them down. You got Egypt below where people are starving to death by the thousands today while I'm preaching today. In Egypt and Africa, they are literally dying because they can't even get a bottle of water or a piece of bread to eat. All of those hungry nations, though they're separate at this time, are going to combine and say, look, we're all hungry, we all need oil, Israel's the only thing that's stopping us. That's when they all come down together and they decide that we've got to have full control. The king from the west is the one that sets up the one world global power that says we must have control over everything. Always remember when you're studying Bible prophecy, there are three things that dictators want to take control of. Number one is military, number two is your finances, and number three is your religion. You remember when a church comes in and, and starts, or, or when they come in on a church as a country and starts dictating what religion you can have, the freedom of that country is quickly dissolving. That's why I told the government, you're not going to tell Emmaus when we can have church and when we can't have church. It's none of your business. Whether there's COVID or no COVID, whether there's a flu or no flu, whether there's pneumonia or no pneumonia, there's no pug-nosed politician from Washington going to tell me to shut the doors of our church. And thank God, thank God we had forefathers when they wrote the Constitution that had enough God in them to say, there shall no law ever be passed that the government control the local church in the United States of America. So, with the endless hours of Bible prophecy that I've tried to discipline myself and study, I've come to a conclusion. It's seemingly that America is either silent or standing in the shadows of Bible prophecy. So I'm going to present to you three possibilities of America's prophetic future. All three of these are possible, 
And all three of these are happening before our very eyes. It seems to me like 33% of America wants to go one way, 33% the other, and 33% left in the middle. Let me show you the three philosophies or theories of where America, this very country, where are we going to be in Bible prophecy? Number one, one third of all the Bible scholars in the world that have ever studied Bible prophecy intently believes that America will bow to the world system and become part of it. This would take a full-scale sellout of our government to foreign identities. Let me say that again. If we are involved in a world system and become as one with that system, that means our government must sell us out to foreign identities. Ladies and gentlemen, can I wake you up today? This is exactly what's going on while I'm preaching in this pulpit today. The more I listen and read to our leaders, the more I'm convinced they are anti-God, they are anti-America, they are anti-free trade, they are against everything the Bible is for. And it seems like they're selling out our government and leadership to foreign identities. This would include this one world system controlling all energy, fuel, electric, and water systems. Guess what Russia bombed two days ago in Ukraine? They bombed the fourth largest electrical producing plant in Ukraine for the whole country of Europe. Now, the reason why they do that is because they want to cut the power off. With no power, you have no communication. With no power, you have no lighting. With no power, you can't move like you need to move. You can't make decisions. You don't have radar systems. And America, believed by some, will join this one world system. They will be tricked into padding their own pockets at the expense of the American people losing their independency and leaning toward foreign dependency. Now, I understand I'm going to make Democrats and Republicans mad today. I fully understand that. So no matter which one you are, get off of it right now before I get started. But I got a problem buying one barrel of oil from a country that hates our country, hates our God, hates our Bible, and would blow us up today if they could. I tell Russia... Keep your stinking oil. We don't need anything you got anyhow. We should have never have shut the pipeline down. We ought to drill, baby drill, and open up our pipelines and be an independent nation. A nation cannot stand against the world system or survive unless it is able to be sustained from within its own borders. The greatest mistake this country has ever made as far as the world system is concerned was dependent on other countries to bring us food, to bring us oil, to bring us electricity, and to raise our food. We should have never let that happen. We were doing well on our own, and we should have stayed that way. I'm going to tell you why America sold out because of these pug nosed liberals sitting in Washington, D.C. that's worried about their Mercedes and their yachts and their mansions and could give a flip about this country. That's why we sold out. Power, corruption, and the love of money will cause any country to eventually crumble. So I begin to study what makes a country crumble. What is the economical collapse that could make America bow to a world system that once we rejected? Let me give you some things that scholars tells us causes a country to collapse. See if this is not our country. When a country has a large trade deficit, it's doomed to collapse. I looked it up this morning, this morning, as the beginning of this year, America is $30 trillion in debt. 
You ever watch these politicians up in Washington? They'll say, yeah, we're going to put 10 million here and 150 million. They talk about millions of dollars like we do pennies. These people are animals up there. I guarantee you, them retards can't even balance a checkbook, but they know how to spend your money, I tell you that much. $30 trillion in debt. The second way is to get involved in wars. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm submitting to you that any day now, this country is going to be involved in a NATO war. Putin is not going to stop with Ukraine. He's like a bulldog that's tasted blood. He will go crazy. He will go into Poland and all those other areas down through there. And eventually, when he hits a NATO country, that causes all the world system to come together. And America being the freest, the stoutest, the strongest, and the most educated with military, we're going to be put right on the front lines. I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm telling you the truth. You young teenage boys and girls here, you better grow up big time. You better get off TikTok and Facebook. You better get off Twitter because your tail's about to go overseas, honey. If God's hand don't move in this country and have mercy on this situation, I'm telling you, you about to put Facebook down whether you like it or not. You're going to start getting up earlier than 11 o'clock and they're going to throw your tail out on a battlefield and you better know what you're doing when you get there, baby. Wars has caused countries to collapse. Revolutions from within. When a country starts dividing and fighting from within, it is on the verge of collapsing. This country is more divided than every president says, I'm going to unite the country. How much dope are you smoking, man? Unite the country. Are you out of your freaking mind? You got blacks over here. You got Asians over here. You got Indians over here. You got hunkies over here. And everybody's wanting their rights. And everybody's nuts. And everybody's wanting to take over. And nobody can get along anymore. And you got BLM. And you got woke theory. You got critical race theory. You got our public schools going to hell. You got parents getting arrested because they stand up for their kids. You better believe it. This country's on the verge of another civil war. And I've been saying that for years famine causes countries to collapse and sell into the world system famine we are in one of the wealthiest countries of the world I own a grocery store in Mississippi shelves are empty we cannot get common foods we cannot get them shipped we cannot get them delivered and God knows if it drops below 60 in Tennessee, you ain't finding a roll of toilet paper for four months. i tell you that right. <laughs> Evidently, you folks get diarrhea at 55 degrees or something. <laughs> I've never seen nothing like it in my life, honey. You only got one tail. And why do you need 1,400 boxes of toilet paper? Because we got frost one night. Now, I know I'm a little edgy. I understand all that. But you that are listening, if you don't like it, shut up and turn the channel. But my people can handle all this. Man, a year ago, I'm paying $1.73 for gas. I just drove all night and drove back from Georgia all night so I could work the church yesterday. I paid five bucks a gallon. Five bucks a gallon. Bacon's up 20%. Meat's up. Man, you start hitting the meat program, now you got me on your back now. You vegetarians, you can have your cauliflower, bless God. I, I, I want meat. Yeah, I know you're skinny and you're wrinkled, but bless God, you had not smiled in 14 years. Won't you stop, go through drive through and get you a Big Mac that high and find out what living's all about. When there's famines and shortages in the land, it makes them want to consume themselves to keep from collapsing and enjoying the world system. When there's a depletion of imported resources. when you Look, I own several businesses and you know that. I cannot get a product to my companies because some of the products come from other countries. And by the way, there's some I don't buy from and I'm not going to get into that. But only American-friendly countries do I have anything to do with. But I cannot get the products here because <laughs> everything is shut down at the borders 
and crates are stacked up as high as the sky. We got ships out in the ocean that are running out of fuel because they're waiting so long to get unloaded. They're telling truck drivers, if you don't pass an EPA inspection with your truck, you can't even come to California and pick up the stuff to deliver it. So hundreds of thousands of truck drivers can't even get into the state to pick up this stuff that needs delivered. It's a funny thing to me. We can back up the border in California, but we'll open it up in Texas and let a bunch of illegals come over by the mix. I tell you what. <laughs> I tell you what. If Biden would transport cargo like he's doing Mexicans, we'd have anything we want before the sun come up in the morning. I tell you that right now. You have anything you want. A country is ready to collapse when it's got government-induced hyperinflation. Somebody said, man, they're running off $100 bills. Everybody's building everywhere. Jesus said in the last days, people are going to be building. People are going to be marrying and giving. The, the, the population is going to be expanding. Oh, yeah, you may have more $100 bills in your pocket than you've ever had. But instead of being worth a dollar, they're only worth 61 cents now. See, it looks good on paper, but it's not worth anything when you deal with the inflation. They said, oh, Biden's came into the office, and I'm not picking on Democrats. The administration came in the office, and man, wages are up 4.5%. Yeah, inflation's up 8 And from where I come from, I'm still on the losing side when you only give me 4 and inflation's 8 That's really nothing to brag about. If you're looking for the president, he's either in the basement, the bathroom, or the bed. That's the only three places you'll ever find him. Am I preaching now? It's only three places you're going to find it. They ever bomb this country, just bomb the basement, the bathroom, or the bed, Biden's gone. So America will crumble from within. And because we cannot feed our people, and because we cannot get imports, and because the vegetation will run short, and our energy levels will fall apart. Because, and by the way, you don't have to bomb an electric grid to get it to quit working. You can do it from a computer sitting in your lap. And these other countries have learned to do that and in a matter of minutes they could shut down the largest electrical grids in this country and every one of us would be without power. And you poor little teenagers, if you went 24 hours without TikTok, you'd hang yourself with your own tongue because you don't know how to live without a screen in front of you. I feel good, man. I like it. I like it. America will bow to the world system. Number two, she will back Israel and become as one. America could stand with Israel so strong that prophecy speaking prophetically, America and Israel will be united and married as one. See, God said something in Genesis chapter 12 when he took one guy named Abraham and said, you're going to give birth to the first full-born Jew, Isaac. And he said, here's the covenant I want to make with you in Genesis chapter 12. He said, I'm going to bless every nation that will bless you because I chose you because you're the smallest of all nations. God chose Israel to prove how powerful he was because instead of taking a big nation, he took one that was literally down to one person. And he said, here's the covenant I'm going to make with you. I will bless every nation that blesses Israel. I didn't say this, God did. Genesis 12, it's called the Abrahamic covenant. I'll bless every nation that blesses you, but I will curse every nation that curses you. Nowhere in the 66 books of the Bible has that promise ever been lifted. America has made a lot of mistakes in her history, but the biggest she will ever make is to turn her back or a deaf ear to the nation of Israel. We are what we are. Look, think about this. There are other countries that should be wealthier than us. There are other countries that have more ability to get metals out of their ground. There are other countries that are able to grow more food than we do. But yet those countries are starving. Have you ever wondered why America is blessed like it is? We throw out enough food every day to feed every hungry nation in the world. Think about that. What makes us different? Trust me, it wasn't our forefathers and our constitution though we're the longest form of government the world has ever known. I'm for the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. I believe God had his hand on those men when they wrote it. But it wasn't just the intellect of those men that wrote the Constitution. What has made this country so great? Think about it. 
We got more money than any other country. We live in better houses than any other country. We drive better cars than any other. Why would we be blessed above all countries? Because when nobody wanted to be a friend of Israel, America stepped up to the plate and said, we'll be your ally. We'll be your friend. And because of that, for all of these years, the hand of God, that's why we can say, God bless America. So, you remember this. You be good to Israel and God will be good to you. Let me give you this and i got to hurry on. Israel's been good to America too. When America was in World War II, Brother Corey, if you'll read the history books, and I've read them over and over and over, I've just always liked fighting and shooting and just hurting people <laughs> that, that are anti what we are. America in World War II was in bad shape. America was not going to get in World War II, by the way. World War II was going on, and Hitler was coming down, and Japan had allied with them, and they were killing Jews by the millions. Hitler killed six million Jews in the crematory, saved their hair, plucked their eyes out, saved their fingernails, saved their eyeglasses and their shoes. He killed six million Jews and burnt them to nothing but ashes. He killed 10 million Germans. And while Hitler was invading and even killing Jews, America said, we're out of it. America never came to the aid of the Jewish people. For the first time, we were silent when Israel needed us. America did not want to get involved in World War II. And it was over there in Poland, in the area where, where Putin is now. And America said, we don't want any. Hitler's crazy, let him do his own thing as long as he leaves us alone. God said, okay, you don't want to fight? I'll make you fight. So he told Japan, I want you to get a bunch of kamikaze pilots. I want you to send them to Pearl Harbor. There was a man on the radar screen in America watching it. And he said, those are American planes on a Sunday morning. They were having church on top of those ships. And he said, this young man on the radar said, those aren't any planes, they're flying too slow and they're flying too low. Those are American planes out doing exercises this morning. And he ignored it. I believe God put blinders on his eyes to bring those pilots in because had Pearl Harbor not been bombed, America would have never got involved in World War II. So because we did not come to the aid of Israel, God turned his wrath upon our country. And son, when Pearl Harbor got blown all to pieces, I've been to Pearl Harbor. Anybody here been to Pearl Harbor? Now, I'm going to take over 30 minutes, so if you're a 30-minute Christian, get out of here. I've been to Pearl Harbor. Stood there, tears running down my face as they showed these innocent people having church on a Sunday morning and them kazakazi pilots coming in dropping bombs and dropping their airplanes committing suicide and blowing up men screaming their bodies going in five different directions blood and guts all over the screens the cameras and everything and they intentionally bombed our harbor I stood there Isaac Kidd was on the USS Arizona I think it was and I stood there from Cleveland Ohio and he was from Cleveland Ohio and the tears ran down my face as over a thousand innocent men and women were killed that morning. And I don't usually tell this, but I'm going to tell it. We came back across the harbor there, and there was about a thousand people in a metal building. Me and my wife was there, and I had a suit on, of course. Everybody else half naked. You know how they do. <laughs> so I walk across this big open building. There's a Japanese guy up there going, So... I grabbed one of the security guards. I said, man, this place is packed. They were all Japanese. Number one tourist site in the world for Japan is Pearl Harbor. Those guys that killed themselves in them planes are considered gods in Japan. That was one of their greatest victories was Pearl Harbor. I said, what's that guy doing? He had a bomb up there, a, a fake bomb, and he was showing how it worked. He said, oh, those are all, all Japan people. This is the number one tourist site for them in the world. He's up there telling them how Japan blew up our harbor. I said, look, let me, let me tell you something. My tax dollars built a building for Japanese people to come over here and brag about killing my forefathers. Is, is that what you, he said, yeah, you know, free country. I said, okay, free country, right? Yeah, okay. Well, then I can, do, I can say what I want to, right? If he can say what he wants to, I can say what I want to. 
Now, I did this. You may not like it. You may never come back again. Fine. You don't like it? Go to Japan. So I walked in, thousand people sitting there, all of them are Japanese. I walk up to the guy. I said, do you know English? He said, a little bit. I said, are you telling them that your forefathers killed my forefathers out there on that harbor? He said, that's what they did. He's a bomb. I said, okay, I want you to tell them something for me in Japanese. You tell them my forefather burnt your forefather into bacon! The security grabbed me. Them Japanese went nuts. They were throwing cheers. And the security team grabbed me. And I, my wife, I made her go to the car. I didn't, I want, somebody's got to live to tell the story. So she's in the car thinking, dear God, what has he done? Here comes this whole security team. And they got me under my arm. I'm the only American in the world that has been thrown off of Pearl Harbor and I'm not allowed to go back. <laughs> so for all you Japanese that are watching me by television or internet, the biggest mistake you ever made, honey, was dropping a bomb in Pearl Harbor because we dropped two bombs in Japan and the war was over in less than 12 hours! Now, America was hurting. We were taking handicapped men into the war because we were so hurting for military soldiers. What turned the war around? Where did we get those two huge bombs that we dropped on those two big cities that literally exploded them into hell? Where did they come from? Sitting here in America was a young man that believed in our country. He supported our country. He believed in our country. His name was Ernest Rutherford. Ernest Rutherford in the middle of the Second World War when we were losing. We were over in Germany, the snow was that high and our men were wearing either no shoes or summer boots. And their feet were black and they were cutting them out of the boots with scissors. They were stiff as a board laying dead in the snow and we were about to go under in World War II in Germany. And Ernest Rutherford, a young man, went in, a scientist, went into the lab and he split the atom. And they made the two atom bombs that were dropped in Japan and ended the war. By the way, Ernest Rutherford is a Jew. <laughs> when America got involved in World War II, when America told Hitler, you're going to go down come hell or high water, you've killed the last Jew. God's wrath was turned away. God's favor was put on this country. And since World War II, we have again been a free nation because America has protected the people of God. Now, i got to close with this one. The third theory is one that I'm very concerned about, and that is that we'll be banished from the face of the earth. Russia has the largest stockpile of nuclear weapons in the world. China is their only ally, as is North Korea. Nuclear warheads, Russia has over 6,200 of them. China has 350. China tonight has the world's largest military with 1.35 million and another 800,000 in reserves. China's total army is over twice the size of America's total army. These missiles can fly as far as 8,000 miles with nuclear warheads on them. There are several kinds of warheads that go to the top of these bombs. One is called a chemical war, warfare, or warhead. It's a toxic chemical such as poison gas and nerve gas, which is dispersed upon contact, which is designed to injure and to kill humans. If you will study the nuclear bomb when it falls, you have what they call the fireball. It'll evolve everything within 80 miles to the north, the east, the south, and the west. An 80 mile block will die immediately when this bomb falls. It only takes one. Russia has 6,200 of them. 
The poisons are lighter than air, so they go out through the air and they penetrate even beyond the 80 mile radius, which is really 160 mile diameter. The poisons go beyond that. It's inhaled by humans and they get sick and die. The other warhead is called biological. It's an infectious agent such as anthrax spores, which again is lighter than air. It's dispersed on contact and it's designed to get into the breathing apparatus of the humans through the nose and the lungs and you will suffocate, get infections, and die. Those that may tolerate the initial bombing, you have the fireball in the middle, then you have the radiation on the outside, then you have the chemical warfare on the outside of that. Anybody that would survive any one of those bombs being dropped would suffer third degree burns from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. You would immediately become sick and radiation poisoning would make you hurt like you've never hurt before. These bombs would target big cities, according to those in our military that are specialists. They said if we were ever invaded with these bombs, it would come into six of our major cities. New York, Chicago, Houston, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Washington, D.C. The air blast would be so dynamic that windows in buildings as much as 30 miles away will crash to the ground. The thermal radiation would go on for days, watching thousands and millions of people stagger through the streets of our city with a musty looking fog while you step over the bodies of dead people. There is nothing that can revert the nuclear bomb once it has been contracted and inhaled. The only thing you left to do is die. If those things begin to be shot toward these countries, it is a possibility, ladies and gentlemen, that this beautiful land that we love would be laid bare on the face of Mother Earth. Sometimes I think we've taken God's blessings in favor too lightly. It's hard for us to believe that buildings can crumble, that people can die, and futures can be ruined. Turn on your television when you get home. Ask the Ukrainian two weeks ago if they would have dreamed that bodies and automobiles and buildings would be crumbled out in the middle of their cities while I'm preaching right now, and untold thousands of hundreds of millions maybe even will die before this comes to an end. Now, I said all of that to say this. No matter which way America takes, I hope she favors Israel. We know one thing as children of God. This world's running out of time. So the intent of my message is to make us aware of Bible prophecy, but it's also to send out a very stern warning Jesus could come at any time. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the Lord Jesus could come. And the older I get, the more I say, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Miss Anna, would you come to the piano? But while I'm saying that, some of you here are not ready. Some of you here are not saved. Some of you here are not born again. And only those that know Jesus Christ are leaving when Jesus comes. Amen. Only those that know Jesus Christ. So, you're going to wake up one day, sir. You're going to look out your window and a lot of people are going to be missing. You're going to see a lot of strange things happening. Graves are going to be bursted open. People are going to be missing. Airplanes crashing. Cars running into each other. Banks not open. The economy's crashing. The sun will be brought closer to the earth. Extreme heat will fill the face of Mother Earth. The water will be turned to blood. It'll be so bad that in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 6, men will seek death and death will flee from them. It's going to be so bad that you're going to want to die, but you're not going to be able to die. And the only way you're going to bypass this, and the only way you're ever going to get to heaven, is you've got to receive Jesus Christ. You've got to be born again. You've got to acknowledge the fact that you're a sinner. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You've got to believe that God loved you so much that in spite of the fact that we're sinners, He sent His only begotten Son to take our place on the cross and pay for our sin debt through His blood and His resurrection. Then all you have to do is come, call on Him. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Think about this. You're one step away from the greatest thing that could ever happen in your life. And you're one heartbeat away from the worst thing that's ever happened in this universe. I pray you'll make the right decision today. Would you stand with your heads bowed?
I want to give an invitation this morning. I feel like somebody here wants to get saved. I think you want to get saved. I think somebody here has been thinking about, man, I'm not really saved, but I'd like to be. So today I'm going to give you that opportunity. This is going to be your chance. So remember, you're not refusing me or a church or a religion. You're refusing God, right? So you refuse God now. Go ahead. I can't stop you. He'll refuse you later. Then you're really in a mess, bro. So I wonder while every head's bowed, I don't put pressure on people. If you want to go to hell, there ain't a thing I can do about it. Help yourself. The good news of the gospel, the gospel means good news. You know what the good news is? You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to go through this awful period of time on earth. And so, shall we ever be with the Lord? God said among those that were rejected and did not want him, and the smoke of their torment shall ascend forever and forever. So if you're here today, you say, Brother Kid, I'm not ready for all this. And I'm not sure I'm ready for God to come. I'm not, I don't know that I'm born again. Do you care enough, just enough, to let an old preacher pray for you right now? Would you just slip your hand up and say, Brother Kid, when I hear preaching like this, it reminds me I'm not ready. I need help. Thank you, honey. I see your hand. Put it right back down. Been praying for you, honey. Anybody else? Come on. Thank you. Thank you. I see that hand. Put it right back down. I'm not going to embarrass you. You know me. I don't do that. Anybody else? Come on. You know you. Thank you, sweetie. Been praying for you every day. You're precious. Nobody knows who's lifting their hand. Thank you, sir. Put it right back down. Come on, brother. Anybody else? I'm waiting just a minute now. You mean you're so far gone? Really? You're so far gone, sir, ma'am. You don't even care if anybody prays for you. Is there one more? There's one. Thank you, sweetie. Thank you. Is there another before I close? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, young lady. Heavenly Father, my heart's heavy today. There's some beautiful people in this building. And they're not ready to meet God today. And I know the message really wasn't all that good. I did my best. Holy Spirit, I pray for every man and woman, little boy and little girl, that lifted their hand and said, Preacher, I'm not saved. They may be religious, have a Bible, go to a church, but you got to be born again. And Lord, I, I can't make them get born again. I can't do it. But I can give them a chance. And I pray for everyone that raised their hand that they'd know I love them and you love them. And this could be the greatest day they'll ever live in their life or in eternity. 